So, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, uh, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends of Latin America and of UNCLAS. Muy buenas noches a todos. Boa noite. Good evening to everyone and welcome to this public lecture presented by the Embassy of Costa Rica, COALAR, which is the Council of, on Australia and Latin American Relations and the Australian National Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Meyer and I'm the director of UNCLAS and is customary. I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians, elders past and present on whose land we meet today and whose cultures and languages are among the oldest on this planet. I have the honor to, and great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Minister Manuel Gonzalez Sanz, who will speak to you about Costa Rica and its approach to global sustainability, sustainable development, and most importantly for us here in the Antipodes, how Costa Rica will connect to Asia Pacific and Australia. The first stone was laid this morning when he inaugurated the Costa Rican Embassy in Canberra in his capacity as Minister of Foreign Affairs, an office he holds since his appointment in May 2014. Minister Gonzalez is an attorney at law and partner at Facio Encañas, one of the largest and most prestigious law firms in Costa Rica and Central America. His legal practice focused mainly on foreign investment, uh, financial and corporate law. He was professor at the law school of the University of Costa Rica, and he obtained a master of law at Columbia University Law School and obtained his Juris Doctor degree at law school at the University of Costa Rica. He has held further multiple offices very successfully in the past. He was Minister for Foreign Trade from 2004 to 2006, and during his tenure, foreign direct investment reached the second highest amount in Costa Rican history. Prior to that, he was appointed ambassador to the United Nations and its specialized organizations in Geneva, Switzerland, from 2004 to 2002 to 2004. Further to this, and this is now the last paragraph, Dr. Gonzalez was vice president of the Human Rights Commission, coordinator of the Caribbean and Latin American Group, advisor to corporations and financial institutions on project finance, um, corporate finance, reorganizations, acquisitions, foreign investment and trade. He also served as board member for the International Bank of Costa Rica. It's an absolute honor to hear and learn from such a well-rounded, knowledgeable and experienced diplomat and politician. Please welcome Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, Dr. Manuel Gonzalez Sanz. I had forgotten about a lot of the things you just mentioned. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them happened many, many years ago. Uh, well, good afternoon, Excellencies, Ambassadors, distinguished guests, professors, students. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you for, for your company this afternoon. It's uh, my real pleasure to be here with you at the Australian National University in the capital city of this vast country in the southern part of Asia Pacific. This morning, I officially opened the Embassy of Costa Rica in Canberra, a few blocks from this campus, another step in the right direction to broaden our horizons in this part of the world. In recent years, as part of our new global perspective, we have turned our eyes towards the Asia Pacific region, gradually increasing our presence here. In addition to our traditional presence in North Asia for many years, 10 years ago, we decided to open our mission in Singapore, India, and Qatar. And most recently, we opened our embassies in the United Arab Emirates, Azerbaijan, Indonesia, and now Australia. For a small country like Costa Rica, this represents a giant, giant step in the, cert in the certainty that Asia Pacific has become the most dynamic and fastest growing region on the world. More profound links of Costa Rica with Asia Pacific are also possible by way of more intense relations with countries such as Australia, 
allowing us to be more actively engaged with this important region of the world. Only an active presence of Costa Rica in Asia Pacific will lead to a more balanced and pragmatic global approach on to international affairs. In that context, making the decision to have a permanent presence in Australia, represented by Ambassador Jairo Hernandez, who's taking pictures back in, <laughs> in the door, thank you, was, we are multitask diplomats, <laughs> was only natural and logic. Our bilateral agenda is full of potential. Thus, the aspiration of an increased partnership between Costa Rica and Australia through more concrete mechanisms of cooperation in areas of common interest will only lead to more beneficial results. In addition to our already existing mutual common interest in multilateral issues, including climate change, human rights, disarmament, and rule of law, I'm, co I'm convinced that we can gradually build a platform for enhanced trade, cooperation, investments through the exploration of stronger complementaries complementarities and mutually beneficial good practices, whether it is on education, the environment, and natural resources, tourism, and culture, among others. I feel happy and excited to see Costa Rican gourmet coffee in Australian outlets, thanks to the entrepreneurial spirit of some of our nationals. Through our new embassy here, we will encourage Australians, Australian business people to explore trade opportunities with our country. And we will support efforts for Australians to take advantage of our unique features, of our unique features as a tourist destination. Education, which is a tool for social progress and mobility, can derive in new avenues for cooperation both for Costa Rican students to continue to come to Australia and for more Australians to land in Costa Rica to study, participate in internships or innovative volunteering projects. We will be delighted to see more young Australians like those in attendance today to cross the Pacific and immerse in a new and lively experience by exploring the unique features of our biodiversity, eco-adventure projects, renewable energy solutions, and environmental care trends. Traditionally, ruled by civilians, Costa Rica has gone a long way as a nation devoted to disarmament, human rights protection, and respect of international law. We are a nation that has experienced seven continuous decades of peace, a country that, was, that once was a primary exporter of agricultural products has become a solid platform and an attractive destination for investment in high-tech goods and services. While welcoming millions of visitors a year in search of the magic of nature and unique ecological treasures. We reasonably believe in a holistic approach to development, knowing that its sustainability should be built on three pillars, economic, social, and environmental. Gracias. Our societies require production of wealth, reduction of inequalities and poverty, as well as fostering environmental protection. Furthermore, from our perspective, development can be sustainable only if it is inclusive and equitable and puts the human being at the center of the public policies. Inequality is one of the main issues, and this applies to rich and poor countries alike. The Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are then Set, at goal, set of goals applicable to every country. This inclusive and equitable approach should be applicable to middle-income countries like Costa Rica. 
Economic transformation should be measured based on a multidimensional approach. The UN system and other relevant institutions must work together to establish more complex yet transparent and fair mechanisms that better reflect our middle-income countries' diverse realities and challenges by defining system-wide guidelines and criteria. People, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership are elements of an integrated approach for shaping the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The Agenda rec recognized important principles for implementation, such as universi universal universality, integration, and leaving no one behind, meaning that it applies to all countries at all levels of development and also to governments and all other actors that the challenges of development are multidimensional and the goals are indivisible and interlinked, and that no person or country should be left behind from the achievement of sustainable development. The development agenda is also closely linked to the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Action in one area benefits the others. The Paris Agreement is a historical success in harnessing much needed global cooperation. However, as science indicates, increased commitment on the reduction of emissions is needed in order to close the gap to achieve our global goals. The urgency of this task demands pre-2020 actions immediately. Our experience in Costa Rica has demonstrated that the argument that environmental protection and emission cuts harms economic growth or development is pure myth. Costa Rica's decision to go renewable was in no way improvised. It's my country's determination since its inception as a republic to craft a political system profoundly committed to ensuring the common good through public education, sound public policies, good public strategic services, and solid democratic institutions. The successful implementation of this vision on human and sustainable development profoundly impacted by the decision to become a disarmed country in 1948 explains why Costa Rica was able to devote the so-called peace dividend into human development programs and to be considered by international standards as one of the happiest nations on earth. We believe that a well-educated, healthy population and without gender bias is a key driver for peace, competitiveness, and the improvement of productivity. While we face major challenges on issues such as infrastructure, we have made important progress in other areas such as technology and innovation. It also explains why, in an inland territory of only 51,000 square kilometers, and while, while being a middle-income country, more than, more than half a century ago, Costa Rica established relevant policies to, towards renewable electricity production. Hydroelectric power is our main source of energy supply. And just recently, my country made an international news for the extraordinary fact that in three consecutive years, more than 99% of electricity production 
was from renewable sources. We were also able to re revert deforestation and protect 25% of our inlands, 17% of our territorial sea it, under some kind of, of either public or private environmental protection regime. In 1940, excuse me, in 1987, the forest cover was 30% of the land, while in 2005 represent, represents, 2015 represents 51.4 of the territory. These conditions reflect our commitment to the world at large. For a small country, we host 4% of the world's biodiversity in only 0.01% of the world's territory. Our strong convic convictions were also reflect reflected in a constitutional reform of 19. 94 that introduces the right to enjoy an ecologically balanced environment. <coughs> At the same time, we have also attained and sustained the high human development categor category in the Human Development Index. In line with this historical trajectory and in compliance with the Sustainable Development Goals, Costa Rica recently drew up its national energy plan with a vision to, to 2030. This national plan was the end product of an ample consultation process among social, political, economic, and business actors, and is consistent with the National Determined Contribution, or NDC, the country presented to the, to the Paris Agreement. Costa Rica presented ambitious commitments in Paris, which maintain our early and visionary pledge to become car carbon neutral by 2021, the bicentennial of our independence, understood as the stabilization of greenhouse gas emissions at 2005 levels, and also commits itself to a much more ambitious goal incorporating a reduction of 25% of emissions by 2030 in comparison with 2012, and by introducing the concept of deep decarbonizing of the economy, which implies the need for significant reduction of emissions until reaching zero net emissions by 2085. Other relevant elements of our national determined contribution are the components of adaptation and considerations of equity and commitment to human rights and quality, equality of gender. In this regard, let us not forget that Costa Rica also committed itself in the context of the Paris negotiations to become a laboratory for the decarbonizing process worldwide. Allow me to reiterate that commitment and assure you of our continued support for all efforts currently underway in order to implement the historic Paris agreements. We must bow to uphold and protect the integrity of those agreements for they constitute a fundamental part of our global patrimony. As part of that formidable task, we have launched the Green Hub, Green Hub, which is our proposal to accomplish these ambitious objectives. The Green Hub is an initiative to operate at the country scale as a laboratory for the decarbonizing of the economy, as I said before. We are generating an ecosystem of innovation to pilot hard and soft technologies that are required in a new low emission economy. We want to operate a such lab laboratory for the implementation of projects, institutional arrangements, and technologies 
which would work as prototypes. The successful prototypes would be scaled up in other countries and regions. We see knowledge sharing as a key element of this Green Hub initiative. And we have, have started knowledge sharing in areas where Costa Rica has been successful, such as conservation and management of natural ecosystems, forestry management, and innovative renewable energy initiatives. We visualize the hub becoming a global epicenter for triggering solutions for post-Paris societies. We consider that national ownership and long-term planning is the key to achieve development goals. In this regard, Costa Rica is in the process of integrating the sustainable development goals into national planning process and instruments, including the production of the indicators needed to measure the advancement towards the, the SDGs. Other important element is the engagement of all sectors of society. On September 2016, Costa Rica was the first country to launch a national sustainable development goals pact. The three branches of government, the civil society, local governments, academia, and private sector committed themselves to work together for its implementation. Also, Costa Rica created a high-level council with the participation of the President of the Republic, the Minister of Planning and Economic Policy, the Minister of the Environment, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This high-level political commitment and coordination is critical for achieving the SDGs. However, on this topic, the march goes on, and we are certain that we will continue to, to raise our voices in order to achieve the common objective of evolving towards a low, global low-carbon development path in order to hold the rise of the global average temperature below 1.5 degrees and increase the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change. While this might seem like a daunting objective, given the forces we, are, we have against, I can assure you that it is not if all commit to rise our ambition in climate action. In order to conduct and achieve the SDGs, Costa Rica focus its commit, their commitment to support small scale and family farming and food production. Costa Rica recognizes that nearly 80% of the extreme poor live in rural areas and work in agriculture. Nearly 800 million people throughout the world still suffer from hunger and family farms seem to be a key to address these interlinked obstacles since they produce more than 80% of the world's food in value terms. To strengthen the international commitment to support family farmers and inspired by the success of the international year of family farming adopted by the General Assembly of the UN in 2014, Costa Rica launched months ago the initiative to declare a decade of family farming within the UN system. We strongly believe that a long-term international commitment in favor of family farmers would greatly contribute to our common efforts to end poverty in all its forms, to reduce inequality, to ensure economic empowerment of women, and to combat climate change among among more than 10 different SDGs that we have considered interlinked to family farming, following also the people-centered nature of the Agenda 2030. Some of the main pillars of the decade that we are proposing 
include the end of all forms of discrimination against women and girls in rural areas and the promotion of the emp their empowerment through the facilitation of access to information and decision-making processes. We believe multilateral action is the most enduring way to achieve sustainability in an age of increasing global challenges because international solidarity and cooperation among states, large and small, is essential for achieving, achieving human development. International net networks are indispensable to face the growing threats we are facing in our planet's environment. We must also carry out truly effective actions of inclusive development, and those actions are mostly of a political nature. They are political because they entail a ground change in policy so that we can effectively address the basic needs of the most vulnerable. These policies imply universal access to high quality education and real access to means that may enable entrepreneurship and ad adequate job access. That is good, stable jobs, well paid. We also note that human rights, obligations, and commitments are also integral, as they have the potential to inform and strengthen international and national policy making in the area of climate change, promoting policy coherence, legitimacy, and sustainable out outcomes. On July 7th, during the conference to negotiate a binding instrument prohibiting nuclear weapons. Costa Rica gave the final blow for the adoption of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Last December, the General Assembly decided to convene this conference. It is true that very few times the international community meets to negotiate an international instrument in such a short notice. But it is also true that the main objective of this treaty had been maturing for several decades. The road to nuclear arms prohibition did not begin on February 16, 2017, when our ambassador in Geneva was appointed president of this conference. But on July 16, 1945, when the first test of an atomic bomb took place, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons arises as a consequence of two realities. On one hand, the frustration of a large part of the international community over the stagnation of nuclear disarmament negotiations over the last decades, and on the other, growing concern about the humanitarian effects of nuclear detonation. The humanitarian dissertation has been working since 2010 and is very well reflected in the preamble of the text. An international legal gap is closed by the adoption of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Since nuclear weapons were the only weapons of mass destruction that were not prohibited, and a moral debt is paid to all those who suffer by atomic bombs and nuclear tests. The testimonies of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki the Hiwakuchas, and of several Pacific Islands during the conference were truly heartbreaking. This is undoubt undoubtedly a victory for Costa Rica and for global dem diplomacy. As a disarmed democracy, we have made multilateral disarmament a pillar of our foreign policy. 20 years ago, we submitted to the United Nations 
a proposal for a convention on nuclear weapons individually. And 10 years later, we did a revised version with Malaysia. In recent years, we have promoted with leadership and conviction the conventions on humanitarian disarmament against anti-personnel mines and cluster munitions, and of course, negotiations to advance the nuclear disarmament agenda. In that map of actors, we must also highlight the role of our region, which pioneered nuclear disarmament through the adoption of the Treaty of Tlatelolco 50 years ago, and in recent years through presidential de declarations in the context of CELAC, the Latin American Community of States. Of course, the fundamental role played by civil society, which was one of the engines of the process, cannot be underestimated. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons not only prohibits the use of nuclear weapons, but also the threat, testing, development, production, manufacture, possession, transfer, settlement, and deployment within other activities. It also leaves the door open, of course, for states possessing nuclear weapons to be part of the treaty. The text also has provisions of victim assistance and environmental remediation. The treaty was open for signature last September 20th, and the Costa Rican president, Luis Guillermo Solis, was among the first heads of the state who signed it. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons should enter into force 90 days after 50 states have deposited the instruments of ratification once their internal procedures have been completed. We also aspire to be within this group and we will encourage our peers to join us in this mission. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Australian Capital Territory community, in concluding my remarks, I want to emphasize that the opening of our permanent diplomatic mission in this city represents a tangible way to reassure our presence in Asia Pacific. We are truly committed to strategically enhance our goals in this region, thus strengthening our global reach and competitiveness. By elevating the intensity of our bilateral relations with Australia through specific initiatives, joint actions, and exchange of good practices leading to more trade, cultural, educational, technological, sports, and environmental links, we are definitely opening a new dynamic chapter in our friendly partnership. More wide-ranging activities will also lead to a more constructive bilateral agenda. May Costa Rica's new presence in Australia become an important milestone in the shared purpose of a more inclusive, peaceful, cooperative, and environmentally friendly world. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, very good ones. Yes, we would like our ambassador in Australia to also be concurrent in New Zealand and other uh, surrounding areas, uh, mainly in, in New Zealand to start with. We need to ask for the agreement and we'll do that uh, shortly. Um, and hopefully Ambassador uh, Hernandez can be also doing a very good work in, in New Zealand. The second question was, uh, eight. Eight. yes. We filed our application long, long time ago. As you know, APIC declared a moratorium of 10 years. They lifted the moratorium, but for practical uh, effects, it is still there because they have not accepted any new members uh, for a, a very long time. My presumption is that uh, since three out of the four Pacific Alliance members are already members of APEC, 
Colombia is the one that is still missing. They will push, push for, for the incorporation of, of Colombia soon. And if that happens, that will eventually open the door for, for other countries. And hopefully, Costa Rica could be uh, within that list. Um, as I said, uh, maybe easily 13 or 14 years ago that we uh, presented our, our, our request to become full members of, of APEC. The middle income concept is uh, harming a lot of countries in the world and Costa Rica is within that group. As you know, about 110 countries are within that category. We are against this uh, concept. We believe that uh, just using a macroeconomic uh, number to determine who receives and who is excluded from international cooperation, it's a mistake and actually does not represent the development uh, level of any country. Uh, and actually, for practical terms, it becomes like punishment because you do a lot of effort to improve your, your way of living and uh, your human development. And then somebody comes and says, you are graduated. You don't need any more cooperation. You are on your own. But at the same time, we go to the General Assembly in the UN and commit as an international community to the 2030 agenda, and then we go to the Paris agreements, uh, and nobody can achieve those goals individually if we don't cooperate, if we don't work together with our neighbors and with the rest of the international community. We need new uh, ways to determine cooperation. And when I talk about cooperation, I'm not only referring to the traditional concept of cooperation, giving money to other countries like uh, charity. No, I'm talking about working together. Of course, it involves money. It involves technical assistance. But in order to demonstrate that countries like Costa Rica still need cooperation, we conducted a very interesting study with the, the Latin American Economic Commission that is based in, in it's part of the UN system, is, is based in, in Santiago de Chile. And they determined the structural gaps that we still have and are preventing our country from uh, unleashing the, its full potential uh, for development. And this technical instrument uh, we are using with some uh, donors and, and other countries in the world to demonstrate that uh, those who still believe in the concept of middle income are wrong. And this study has been used to do the same in other countries in Latin America now. And we are leading a group in the context of, um, of the UN in New York um, and our goal is to put this discussion sooner than later at the center of the discussions in, in New York. Obviously, we have a lot of challenges. There are a lot of countries that do not want to discuss about this. It's, it's very easy to, you know, to exclude 110 countries uh, in the world and keep graduating the rest and forget about working together, uh, as I mentioned. So it's a, it's a real challenge. But, uh, and that's why I always included uh, this matter of middle income countries in, in my agenda, in my uh, bilateral meetings, and also in my, in my speeches in the multilateral arena. So thank you for, for that very good question. Mm -hmm. Well, you're touching upon some of the main challenges that we, that we have. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I'm sure you remember the external debt crisis in the early 80s. All of the Latin American countries uh, were affected by that. Costa Rica was not the exception. And we had the uh, development model of uh, 
import substitution uh, created also by the Cepalino model. And that time coincided with, uh, also with an oil crisis, uh, as you remember. Uh, so we had to learn it the hard way. Uh, our economy went bankrupt at that time. Uh, and if we add the stubborn decisions of the president at that time, it <laughs> made the whole thing even worse. So, and at that time we were basically dependent on, on, on four commodities, uh, bananas, sugar, meat, and coffee. And those created the, the those were the sources of, of hard currency. Uh, so the, the economy went down and it was a complete disaster. And it needed to be stabilized and um, we realized the hard way that we needed to transform our economy, open up the economy, integrate it to the global economy, and we did it gradually. Um, uh, nowadays, we are proud to say that we are exporting 4,500 different products to 160 countries in the world. Agriculture products are still important, but just to give you an idea, even though coffee is still very important, and we are well known for the quality of our coffee, coffee only represents 3% of exports nowadays. So diversification and transformation of the economy were the, the, the key elements. And another thing that um, we decided a long time ago was not to compete with low wages, wages, salaries, those industry, mainly the ones related to the textile uh, industry, move elsewhere because our salaries were much higher than other countries, and in particular uh, in China. Uh, so labor protection has always been very important for us. Uh, protection of our labor force. We have to watch out because in some occasions it has put us uh, a uh, very high uh, level, uh, becoming very expensive to do, to do some business. And the other thing that we decided was to be, um, to have a, an economic uh, development model that will protect the environment, that will be friendly with the environment. Nowadays, everybody talks about uh, those issues, and it's good that finally we as international community we are conscious about that. But the reality is that Costa Rica started to protect the environment in the mid 60s with national parks, with reserves. Uh, as I said uh, in my speech, nowadays between 25 to 30% of our territory is, is protected uh, in some way, uh, either as a national park or private reserves and, and the government pays for what we call uh, environmental services uh, pays the owner to preserve um, primary forest and, and also some incentives to uh, reforest uh, uh, the land. And the other element that I would add is something that I also mentioned. The money that we were using to have an army until 1948 when we abolished the armed forces, that money was dedicated to human development, basically health and education. We are uh, spending 7.7 .7 of the equivalent of 7.7 percent .7 of GDP on education. That's much higher than some countries in Europe. And health investment, uh, investment on, on the health sector, is 10 percent of GDP. So uh, that has allowed our people to be educated and healthy and skillful. And when companies come, and when we talk to companies after they have come to Costa Rica, they always point out that what we can offer them is human talent, skillful and healthy people. And well, tourism is also very important. We developed uh, that industry and is doing very well, growing very fast, uh, double digits per year, and uh, also developing the in a sustainable in a sustainable manner. Uh, 
it's always uh, difficult, in particular being in diplomacy, to talk about other countries. But just to, to make the idea, we don't want to develop our tourist industry in the style of Cancun. I love Cancun. It's beautiful. Been there many times. But one hotel after the other, you know, we don't like that. It's a different model. It's more sustainable. And it's spread all over the country. So it has a very important social impact. It's not just one concentration where, where the surrounding cities are benefiting from, from tourism. It's all over the place. And we have the Caribbean, and we have the Pacific, and in the middle we have a, a lot to offer, and we have volcanoes and rivers and the dry forests and the rainy forests and uh, many options. And it's a stable and secure country, and that attracts the, uh, tourists. Uh, so I, I would say that is a combination of different factors. Yes, uh, we had a, a, a very important investment by Intel for many years, manufacturing microchips. Uh, they moved that facility to Vietnam. It was a, a, a big impact. But they transformed that into a research and development center. So now they are designing there the microchips that will be used in the computers in the, in the near future. They lay off about 4,500 people, but they hired about 2,000 engineers. It's not the same, not the same. It had an important impact, but they are still there in, with another project. So it's not that they didn't want us. We didn't take it personally. <laughs> it's because, you know, the trend moved somewhere else, and, and Asia, well, it's, uh, we need to compete uh, in a better way. And nowadays, the main product of exports is uh, medical devices, medical devices, high-end medical devices, from stems to heart bulbs to a lot of things that they use in, in hospitals. And we have created, gradually, doesn't happen from one day to the other, a uh, very important cluster. There are about 80 multinational companies uh, in that particular sector, in medical devices manufacturing. Uh, one fourth of the Fortune 500 companies are doing business in Costa Rica. We have about 350 multinational companies, uh, big scale, and of course, uh, medium and small size companies uh, are also very, very important. And we, we, we want to, to incorporate, it, incorporate them, the, the SMEs, into the value chains. So it's... Uh, a lot of challenges, but uh, we are working on them. Not all the time we are successful. We have a, a lot of things to, to improve. We need to improve the infrastructure. Uh, it's uh, one of the sectors that needs uh, more attention. But of course, the government doesn't have the economic resources to invest uh, in infrastructure. One of the main problems we have as, as government is that we are running a, a high fiscal deficit. I just came from a meeting with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Bishop, and she was very worried because the fiscal deficit of Australia is 1.6%, and almost claiming it as a disaster. <laughs> and I told her, well, our deficit is 6%. <laughs> so can you imagine if you put that in proportion? We are and we inherited. We didn't create it in this administration. I always have to point out because it was the responsibility of, of previous administrations, the previous two administrations. And I, 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 I am not an economist, but uh, if you deliberately create a deficit because you are building infrastructure and, and power dams and, and, and um, roads and bridges, well, at least it's something that you see. But in our case, these two governments um, hired about uh, 35,000 new uh, public servants. So how, how can you get rid of them now? Uh, transforming the public employment regime is, 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 is difficult, uh, of course, and popular. But, well, that's another story. But that's the main challenge we are having at the government's level. 
we have been fortunate that that factor has not contaminated the rest of the economy. The economy is grow is, has been growing at a, an average of 4.2% 4 per year. It's a very stable economy. The exchange rate is, is stable. Inflation is extremely low, around 1% per year. So that has helped. Migration? Oh, immigration. well, uh, immigration is a, is a is a is a situation that is affecting everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody. There is no single country that uh, is the creator of the phenomenon or is is the the destiny or, or, or has the, the the tools to solve the, the the situation. If we don't work together, in particular in Latin America. Uh, for instance, uh, we had the, the um, uh, we ended up having about 10,000 Cubans by the end of 2015 who wanted to get to the United States because of the dry food, wet food policy that they had at that time. Uh, they were coming through through Ecuador <laughs> yeah. because of the yeah yeah it's, 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 it's reality. I mean. There were different factors. I'm not, I'm not talking against Ecuador, your country. I'm just pointing out that for many years, we as in the international community insisted on Cuba, on letting people go out and uh, give them, you know, legal documents to travel abroad. That was one factor. They started to, to flexibilize the, the, the policies to let people uh, travel abroad. Um, you didn't request visa. For, for Cubans, so they started to come, thousands of them, to, to Ecuador and started fleeing north uh, to get to the United States because of these policies. As you know, just by claiming I'm a Cuban, uh, when you touch uh, American soil, you already were entitled to some special immigration benefits. Hmm? So that was an attraction for, for thousands of people. Um, as you remember, the, the Obama administration, at the very end of the administration, changed that, that policy. And so the numbers have decreased. You were very helpful in uh, imposing the visa uh, again. So the numbers went down. And what I'm saying with this is that we were able to work together. If you or any country would say, no, it's not my problem. They come and go. It's not my problem. So you pass the problem to, to the next country. That's not fair. So we need to work uh, because nowadays, in our case, we used to be just a transit country. So it would be very easy just not to pay attention to the thing and let people go. But now we are also receiving a lot of uh, migration from many countries around the, the area. And in addition to that, and not many people realize this, is that during the last four decades, we have been receiving migration, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands from Nicaragua. <laughs> Usually the migration is south to north. Here is north to south. I don't know if these numbers are correct, but I was told a couple of years ago of a survey done in Nicaragua. I think the numbers are very high, but may be true. And they said that about 50% of the population will leave the country if they could. And 80% of that 50% would go to Costa Rica. And we cannot prevent them from coming. I mean, it's too porous, the, the, the border. The river, the mountains, uh, I mean, we don't have the resources to stop them, right? Nowadays, more or less, 13% uh, of our population, and we are only 5 million people, about 13% are Nicaraguans. Uh, during all this time, I'm not talking about bad about Nicaragua. Nevertheless, I can talk very bad about the government of Nicaragua, and I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a very tense uh, situation with them. But we solve our issues in The Hague, in the International Court of Justice. Uh, actually, right now, we have three cases with them there. 
uh, but um, um, we have been able to incorporate them into our economy and to be into our social uh, structure. So we see a benefit in the migration. But the migration has to be uh, in order, has to be regular, and has to be secure. Because we always see the migration flows from the human rights perspective, not from a national security mm -hmm. perspective. National security is secondary. Other countries see it as a national security threat. So it's a different approach. So we have to have this dialogue uh, among ourselves, I mean, in, in the region, in the Latin American region. And uh, of course, as, as you know, we are countries working for the, um, how do you say in English? The Pacto Mundial, the, the Immigration Worldwide Pact that will be negotiated global in global, global pact. pact in Mexico next year. So um, we are receiving a lot of migration from other countries in Central America and also from the, from the South. Um, last year, we ended up having about 22,000 uh, so-called extra-regional migrants. They were claiming uh, to come th uh, from Africa. Uh, finally, we ended up realizing that 98% of them were coming from Haiti. A and why? And it's, it's, it's a reality, and we have discussed this openly. Uh, as you know, after the earthquake in Haiti um, in 2011, Brazil put, a, put in place a, a program to allow them to come to, to Brazil. Uh, and they have about uh, more than 100,000 nowadays. That program is still in place. And they enter legally in, into Brazil and uh, with a working permit. But uh, they also want to go to the United States. <laughs> right? So we ended up having 22,000. It was very, very, very difficult situation for us with no international assistance at all. Millions of dollars we had to spend in order to feed them, give um, health services, entertainment, um, uh, the kids, the pregnant woman. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult to handle. And for such a small country, 20,000 people is a lot of people. These are not just boxes you put in storage. So it was a, a real problem. Uh, and well, we talked to Brazil, we talked to other countries, and we were able to, not to solve it, but at least put some things in order. Uh, they were coming, obviously, through, through Panama. So we talked to the Panamanian authorities. We reached a plan to allow only 100 per day, but they were coming from all over the place. So it was difficult. But they didn't want to stay. But we, need, we needed to protect them because the coyotes, the, the, the smugglers, the, the, were flying around like uh, sopilotes, you know, <laughs> trying to get them and, you know, uh, take them away from the authorities who were giving protection, just protection. They were free to stay in the, in, in, and go around the country. They were not prisoners. They had a, 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 we granted a, a, a legal visa to stay temporarily. But it's, a, it's an issue that is not being solved yet. It's quite a problem. It has gone down, but we need to be prepared for the next uh, wave. 